Welcome to the Food Professor Podcast, episode 27. I'm Michael LeBlanc. And I'm Sylvain Chalabois. The Food Professor is brought to you by Omnovos, the d- digital customer engagement solution for grocery and restaurant marketers, helping you deliver personalized and segmented experiences at scale. Find out how you can get personal and grow sales by making every customer interaction count with Omnovos at www realcustomerengagement.com. All right, so man, welcome. We've got lots of meaty things, or should I say cheesy? We're going to get to that uh, NAFTA, or should I say the USMCA thing that's, that's just right. been uh, happening this week. We'll get to that. Uh, we've got a great guest, uh, one of the finalists from Canadian Grand Prix, Suresh Kola from Nutramilts. Interesting story of an entrepreneur who took five years of science, 25 years background, to create a, you know, I thought everything that could be done in vitamin category had been done, but it turns out these no, tablets yeah. kind of melt on your mouth. It's a really interesting story. Um, so have you, have we'll you talk tried? About uh, have you tried them? No, I no? haven't. They're vi- they're very new at you know in the Canadian Grand Prix Awards, which we're a proud sponsor of. Um, the products have to be introduced in the calendar year prior. So uh, I haven't. I hadn't heard of the product. This is another great thing about the Canadian Grand Prix process. Everybody including the trade, gets to hear about products maybe they haven't seen before. Um, so no, I haven't tried it. But the description is really cool because as you'll hear, uh, its bioavailability is really great. In a, you, Suresh gives me this example of iron pills, which for some, you know, they upset your stomach and they go through the kidney before Absolutely. they get to the bloodstream. Yeah. In his formulation that just melts instantly on the tongue, apparently, uh, it's bioavailable and doesn't pass through any of that stuff. So Your you get body the iron. Absorbs, absorbs the vitamins much more quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, much more quickly and directly, which I didn't think about, you know, and there's less um, binders and there's less additives, you know, if you're going to make a pill kind of thing. Anyway, so really interesting story. Uh, and we'll get to that interview a bit later. And reminder to all the viewers or listeners, uh, we're putting out lots of great bonus episodes uh, from Canadian Grand Prix finalists. Uh, and so check those out. They're all available and uh, we'll have more of those to come. So lots of great interviews uh, yeah, to come. Yeah, the last doing... one with, uh, with uh, Tatiana Bossy mm. was amazing on vegan butter. Yeah, great, great listen. Yeah, you know, and it, that's the fun, right? I mean, I know you you share my en- excitement and enjoyment of this, listening to these entrepreneurs and, you know, hey, why can't we make a vegan butter and, and this whips together this concoction of great product that comes in the vegan butter. So, you know, and the chips, we, we did hard bite chips from Vancouver. Um, That's right. Yeah. The only downside to that, Sylvain, was I had to go out and buy a bunch of those chips to try after, <laughs> after the interview. And I can tell you that they are delicious chips like well, if you that's, that's I, the thing about these episodes you want to try new products that you're not acquainted with so it's great that's innovation so uh yeah i know it's 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 great to see so much innovation happening it's it's also great to celebrate that innovation as well yeah well and it really brings to life our brand what we do here right we talk about innovation but bringing these folks on whether it's an interview or bonus episode is really kind of living you know living the brand so to speak you're living our values of supporting that so anyway it's all great uh, let's get into some stuff. So latest research, let's start with the latest research from the lab on the future of the grocery industry. Um, lots of things to unpack out of that. As always, I think it was done with your folks at Cattle, right? Yeah, uh, that's cattle right. Research. Yeah. Um, and as always, like 10,000 respondents. So this isn't like a random sample of a couple of hundred people. Like it's a big, big sample, which always impresses me about about the sample. So a couple of big learnings out of that that I saw, and the media seems to be picking up particularly on the whole self-serve, uh, self-checkout angle. Let's get self-checkout, to that a bit. Self-checkout, yeah. Let's get to that a bit later because that's an interesting an interesting uh, element of, of retail, not new, but interesting. So well, what give we me the- did basically about a month ago, uh, Cattle and our lab sat down and we wanted to take stock about like about the grocery business uh so we looked at the last 16 17 months and, and tried to understand what it what it all means for the future for for mm. grocers and it's it's strictly retail we didn't look at service at all just retail so we looked at different things that we think could change and we basically went back to Canadians and asked them about Loyalty programs, physical distancing, self-checkouts, uh, 
where you're shopping. Have you changed where you're shopping? Uh, things are going to be looking for uh, local foods. I mean, we actually surveyed a lot of people about a lot of different things. That's why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you got the report, you probably felt this is a potpourri of a lot of different things, which is exactly what it is. Yeah, I I was so impressed because um, just getting people to answer all those questions because it was it, it, you know many of your reports dive deep into certain areas, you know, consumption of red meat or or gardening or whatever. This one is is kind of almost an omnibus of the future and it's the, the timing couldn't be better because you know I I do a lot of work with uh with uh, partners in the US and the Americans are finished with the pandemic. Let me tell you, they're moving on. <laughs> like what you can like, see that I, when you look at a baseball game or a hockey game that I mean the stands yeah. are full of people. You know my oh, yeah. my last podcast with Steve Dennis on the Remarkable Retail podcast is titled The Turning Point, Retail's Turning Point. Like they don't want to talk about COVID anymore. When I do my interviews with U.S. retailers, they're really? past it. They don't want. They don't want to talk about lessons learned. They don't want to talk about post-COVID. They're like, let's get on with this. You know, the big. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 funny, right? Because you know they had a great day yesterday. Only thirty-five thousand infections, but you know, hospital things are down. Like it's all relative, right? No, that's um, right. But as soon as the CDC said you can take your mask off if you're double, if you're double vaxxed, and Keep in mind, only thirty. Which is more of an incentive than you know a right. public that's health policy. I, well, that's how it was designed, right? <laughs> of I mean, course, yeah. You know, I was looking at the numbers today. Canada is actually now past America in terms of eighteen plus getting a single dose. We passed the U.S., so it's a great achievement actually because we were lagging. You know, think yep. back a couple of months ago. We now passed the U.S. Now, where they're way ahead of us is in double vax, right? So they've got. Yep. Um, Almost forty percent of the adult population, or fifty percent of the adult population, thirty-seven percent of the overall, you know, twelve plus. We're, you know, we're in the teens still. We're way down there in terms of double public policy choice. Actually, um, I've had mine. I don't know. Have you had? Have you had the opportunity to have your your uh, shot? Yet? Actually, I got my. We got our jabs uh, this week. Actually, so oh, congratulations. Uh, yeah, we feel we feel healthier already. Uh, but my guess, like in the United States, uh, they're going to have some issues getting more people vaccinated because yeah. as as politics are in the United States, vaccine politics are very polarized. Uh, yeah. Some like many, many Americans are very committed to um, to the rollout, while others are actually committed to be against uh, the rollout in Canada. Well, but- I mean, we're more inclined, I think, to listen to what the government is telling us to do. And, and frankly, I, I think we, uh, we believe in, in science, uh, I think. And so uh, that's why Canadians actually have faith in, in what's going on right now. You know, I always, I always, when I compare the U.S. to Americans, it all goes back to our relative constitutions, right? The American constitution, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, the Canadian constitution, you know, order and good government. Right, That's they're fundamentally right. two different nations, and and you can see those approaches. Vaccine has been Canada. I thought the American uh, slogan was uh, "In God We Trust, the rest we cash." I, the rest I, pay I, cash. I miss- <laughs> <laughs> that too. I that, one. <laughs> that too. Anyway, we're kind of off topic, but it is relevant because as we start to think now, we're almost at a turning point. I think for sure, it's still tough days. I know in Halifax, in in Ontario. It's still essential till mid June. You know, Deanne Brisebois and the Retail Council of Canada is apoplectic. You know, why yeah. are we still closed? It's been extended now. Restaurants are still closed, starting to open up in BC. But so I think not- the tone is much more positive now. I mean, all yeah. provinces are looking at, uh, uh, you know, uh, allowing people to uh, go out and about. Uh, I mean, yeah. most of the bigger provinces like Ontario, Quebec, BC this week. So you're seeing, I mean, peop, rules are, are going to be uh, much uh, more flexible now. And I think people will yeah. appreciate that, especially going into June. Well, let's let's bring this all back to this study before we move on the study. Let's talk about self-serve. So self-serve, nothing new. Technology has been yeah. around 20, 25 years. Uh, adoption, plus or minus. I mean, some there's, there's two schools of thought, right? Like uh, some people love it. A third of people love it. A third of people use it occasionally. It's not great for a lot of items in your basket, but there's nothing better for a quick checkout. Sometimes you hear 
Uh, people say, I think it's taking jobs away from other people, check out jobs. But I know when I talk to retailers, particularly grocers, they say, listen, I, I, I'm not changing my labor, my labor, I'm moving them to be more value added. Wouldn't you want someone in the cheese section? Exactly. To help you? What, what, what did you learn? Your, yeah, yeah, you're repurposing your human capital or, or your employees. And, and, and I do, like a lot of Canadians actually do think that uh, self-checkout lanes are job killers. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it's mm. an invitation for the industry to um, change its method or its approach to managing people. Uh, I mean, we in agri-food in general in Canada, we're very dependent on labor, uh, not as much on capital. And it should be the other way around. When you look at nations like the Netherlands and Germany, and there's more focus on capital and capital investments, which eventually makes human capital or employees much more valuable, as you just said. Yeah. Uh, they actually can add value to your own model by utilizing data, by using predictive analytics. And these are the things we need more in the grocery business, not less. So instead of actually having people bagging things, you're basically asking people to predict what is going to go into those bags at what time of day, quantities, what are the combinations that we're looking at over the next few days. So inventory management practices can change, can adapt. The way you design your store will also change as well to make everything more efficient. And frankly, for consumers, it makes the grocery experience much better. So the self-checkout debate I really enjoy because it goes, I think, at the core of this of this dilemma, this debate between mm. human and humans and machine, uh, mm. which is which has been bothering a lot of people over the last few, over the last little while. So, did you perceive from the output of the research that attitudes, perceptions, use has changed because of COVID? Do you think COVID's been a catalyst or a, an accelerator to adoption? What What did you learn? Yeah, so the uh, so when we sat down with cattle to design this uh, this report, uh, so we went out to field and and immediately when I got the results, I I saw results related to self checkouts and I thought, well, this is interesting, which is why mm. it became the teaser to the report, which is why you're right. hearing about self checkouts right now. <laughs> we have seen a change. Um, because I remember back in 2019, uh, when we started to survey Canadians on this issue, uh, they the younger generations were always on board. Uh, they weren't necessarily uh, they were very comfortable with the uh, with the with the concept itself. The older generations, though, about 15 percent of Canadians over the age of 55 uh, actually embrace the existence of self checkout lanes. Mm. Uh, the younger generation was about 40%. Now today, if you combine all demographic groups right now, if you're, if you give a choice to a Canadian, no matter what age they are, uh, they'll look at both the cashier and the self checkout line equally as an option to exit as soon as possible. Now, depending on how many items they have, right, right, if right. they have five or 10, they'll probably be inclined to use self checkout lanes. Given the technology, which has been, let's be honest, a nightmare <laughs> compared to like ATMs and banking. I mean, yeah. they figured out like 30 years ago how to make the experience seamless. But in, in, a, in a grocery store, there's always something that goes wrong. Something actually happens which requires some assistance. And it seemed almost by design just to make sure that people – appreciate that there's something somebody employed to support people using self-checkout lanes. It's, the it, pandemic it, has actually pushed people to consider self-checkout lanes because frankly, they want to reduce the amount of risk they're yeah. supposed to. Yeah. The interaction and, and they want to get out as soon as possible. And, and that's yeah. why I think self-checkout lanes have gained currency. And if you look around the country, um, some stores actually have gotten rid uh, stores that have gotten rid of self checkout lanes have are putting them back in again, and yeah. some are actually adding more. Why? Because people are using them more often now. 
Well, I think uh, whether it's attitudinal or just trial, in other words, a lot of people kind of shied away. If you hadn't used it, you shied away. You said, oh, it's too complicated. And you're like, okay, during the COVID era, I'm going to keep the employee safe, safe, keep myself safe. I'm going to try it. And, you know, sometimes trial generates use, right? It forms a yeah. habit. Um, I, I had a, I interviewed the, uh, the president of NCR, you know, the big uh, old national cash register, but yes. uh, NCR, and they make ATMs and they make, they own the lion's share of the global self-checkout. And I said, why aren't we farther ahead? Like the technology isn't dramatically different than when I exactly. first got into retail. Yeah. And, and there's a bunch of reasons for it. I think they were betting a little too much on uh, RFID, you know, just scan the basket and, and go. And speaking of Go, of course, Amazon has their their Go uh, fresh format, which is all camera based for, for self checkouts. It's pretty cool. We have our baskets. Anyway, the, the short answer is that's what they're working on, right? More like uh, camera vision that can see everything going by. So you don't have to swipe everything and it gets yeah. around what you're saying, you know, the, 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 the tag missing from the apple that you're buying, right? That's where everything goes south, right? Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that's a great study and I'll post a link to it on the, uh, is it available now on the site, on the Dell site? Is, it is available uh, on our website. And uh, I mean, there's, there's lots uh, in this lots report. In oh, yeah, yeah. We, we look at local, we look at uh, distances you're willing to travel, 25% of Canadians have actually changed where they grocery shop. 20, that's one in four, wow. Michael. That's a wow. lot, like, like in 16 I, months. Are you kidding me? Like like grocers would, would you know sell their kidney for 1% of share of change. Now we're talking 25% yeah. of change. It's really, and, that and is- by the way, Yeah, and StatsCan just last week told us that, I mean, the, the sales uh, uh, for grocery stores are, uh, are going down uh, for the third month in a row. So you can see yeah. things are tightening up and it's going to become more competitive. And, 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 and in order to keep your market share, in order to keep uh, the same amount of traffic in your store, you're going to have to make sure that people feel safe. And one way to do it is to actually make sure that they have options as they exit the grocery store, which is... Yeah. By the way, Michael, the worst uh, managed portion of the grocery experience ever in the history <laughs> is that exit strategy. I mean, it's still yeah. a work in progress. Well, a couple of comments on that. Um, I think there's some noise in the data, the StatsCan data, because if you recall, think back to this time last year, I was speaking to a retailer. He said, he said you know, as we think about April last year, people were stocking up. On, on pantry loading. They didn't know what was going to happen. Like April was a very tough month and May too last year. So I think some of it's just a year over year weirdness, right? I got a year supply of toilet paper. You're not going to comp that off as the retailers would say. So I'm not sure grocery shopping has gone down. I mean, in Ontario here, you can't go to a restaurant. So the, the rationale is still the same. You you got to go to the grocery store. Um, and the, sec the second part is really interesting. Uh, though I forget exactly where I was going with that. So I know it's interesting, but I completely forget <laughs> where I was going with it. But don't forget, uh, I mean, Michael, it's from month to month, yeah, the, no. not the, the decrease, the 1.5% yeah. is a decrease from uh, from March. Uh, and February right. was a decrease, there was a decrease of work compared to January. So since Christmas, uh, sales are dropping. And so that's why I think uh, things are going to get tighter as the economy gets more normalized, as people go out. Uh, it, it's going to be it's going to be tough. Mm. I, I, I'm, I am expecting a lot of uh, and that's the other thing that came out in our report. Discounting is going to be so critical. I mean, mm. you're already uh, grocers are converting uh, grocery stores into discount stores now. And we are expecting that trend yeah. to continue. Yeah, I, actually, I remember what I was about to say. I was talking to Jeff York a while ago from Farm Boy, and he he his entire focus was on the checkout. You were talking about the checkout process, and he said, "I'll never have self checkout because that's my opportunity for my associates to greet people." And you know, sometimes you never talk to somebody until you check out. So, you that's know, right. I think it is. I think it's a winning moment. Um, anyway, so you know what? I bet you we're going to come back to that study because there's so much facts in it that will probably come up over the next couple of months. Uh, Probably. As we talk. Let, yeah. let, let's move on. Let's talk about, uh, you know, the, you, all, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So our friends in the U.S., uh, you know, they're cheesed off. They're going after yes. dairy. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, on the one side, this is how the process is supposed to work. They file a grievance. Thank goodness we have a NAFTA or a USMCA or actually COSMA. Thank we you, have Donald a, Trump. <laughs> well, it, we have a grievance process and, you know, 
we negotiated a pretty good deal, right? Uh, so they're complaining. I think they're complaining that we're not honoring the spirit of opening up the market. Is have I got that right? Well, so I mean, what's what's happening? So we've opened up our borders uh, to more dairy products coming from the U.S., uh, which is fine. But it's like anything; it's when things get operationalized that you you get to see the problems. And so, if you wanted to import products, so who actually who does import these dairy products from the United States? Well, licenses were. It was the responsibility of the Canadian government to license companies uh, so they can actually uh, have the right to buy products from the U.S. Uh, and, and enter the Canadian market. What was decided in Canada, of course, to protect uh, dairy farmers and and because and a lot of dairy farmers are, are owners of dairy processors, most of the licenses to import products from the U.S. were given to dairy processors. And so companies like Loblaws and Sobeys are a little upset because they want to sell high-end cheese. They want to sell different cheeses. but They what, don't have quota. They don't have enough quota to do it, right? That's is right. That, that's but what appears to be happening is that processors, and often they're in conflict because they are owned by dairy farmers themselves, mm. uh, are importing not-so-great cheese to be sold to Canadians uh, to perhaps – allow Canadians to consider better Canadian cheese. And, and of course, a lot of our cheeses uh, are great, are great products, but not all of them. And I think consumers will want more variety, not less. That's why we sign these trade deals. So the how the system actually has function is not necessarily working well for, for consumers. That seems to be the problem, mm. and which is what the Americans are contesting right now. Okay. Sorry. I uh, I wasn't expecting a phone call, so sorry. No problem. Okay, so that's that's uh, we'll keep an eye on that. That's the Biden government doing what they're doing, and there's other files that are, you know, this pipeline disagreement, uh, softwood lumber. So uh, trade agreements uh, continue apace. It's not like the Biden administration doesn't have a lot of things on its plate. But uh, no, what I know. think may happen. I mean, we may actually uh, Canada may actually be forced to recalibrate. Uh, how licenses are given internally. And I suspect mm. that companies like Loblaws and Sobeys may actually get more licenses so we can right. get more choices. Now, uh, will prices drop <laughs> for us? Yeah. It's will more choice get than cheaper? It, probably uh, not, right? No, I don't think so. It's more about choice and variety more, more so than anything else. Well, speaking of uh, speaking of choice and variety, I'm enjoying a nice uh, coffee today with a bit of oat in it. Oh my goodness! Let's oh. say it together: billions, Oatly, oh. <laughs> ten billion billion dollar this market is cap. Unbelievable. My God! Like, unbelievable. Like, five years ago, could you have imagined an oat-based beverage company with a ten billion dollar market cap? What's going on here? It's the non-ag money. I mean, all of a sudden, non-ag money. Of course, there's the, there's there's a lot of silliness out in the market right now with Bitcoin, and people are are very very um, they're they're risk on. Uh, they're risk on, and ag has always been seen as a risk on sort of space, right? And that's why there's uh, and commodities are rising. There's a lot of excitement around food because we've been focused a lot. The Western world mm. has been focused a lot on food sure. the last 16, 17 months. So investors are thinking the same way. Uh, and of course, on the other hand, there's there's some speculation around uh, animal proteins, thinking perhaps more people will move away from animal proteins for a variety of reasons. And so that's why I think the non-ag money is looking into ag. And so... I I mean the number is impressive, ten billion dollars for only, but they actually was they were able to raise that capital in a in a in a nanosecond, which is yeah, really yeah, impressive. Yeah. I, I wish we could do the same in Canada. There is some excitement in Canada, but it's still most of Muted. it still comes yeah. from yeah, it's still from agri-food, old money in the sector. We don't have a Silicon Valley in Canada, unfortunately. And so that's kind of what's yeah. missing right now. 
I mean, uh, you know, our friend Arlene Dickinson has the same complaint and she starts her fund to invest in food because if you look at where the startup money goes, there is a, a duly a startup. It's all fintech, financial tech, and it's all uh, B2B tech in Canada, That's right? right? That's where that they get the lion's share. And, and you're right. There's, I mean, even Suresh, our, our great uh, interview today That's right. with uh, Nutramelts, you know, that if, if that could be a blockbuster idea. Um, I think it's harder for than easier for them to attract uh, investment. Speaking of which, things are looking up for the vertical farming vertical, so to speak. Three hundred million dollars goes into yeah. Bowery Vertical in the state. So clearly, uh, whether it's a mix of exactly what you're saying, just a lot of money in the market looking for a home with a bit of risk. But this is not the first we've seen of vertical farming. It, it, are you thinking that at scale this could be a thing? This could be bigger, safer. What do you think of vertical farming? Yeah, could it, could I, I it be a thing? So. Um, yeah, we've seen some uh, really great investments in Canada with McCain and 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 Goodleaf and and Demers in Quebec, and so there's there's some millions being poured into vertical farming, and we need more, obviously. But in America, again, when you look at scale, I mean, it's just unbelievable. The McCain yeah. Goodleaf deal was worth about thirty million. Demers is a nineteen million dollar project. Now we're talking 300 million and earlier this year out of Kentucky, there was a project worth, I believe, a billion dollars. So you can see that really scalability is still an issue in Canada. We're only 38 million people, but land is cheap here and we have plenty of water. And so we have great resources we can use and we also have clean energy in many parts of the country. So there's a lot that we can do uh, as a country uh, and, and grow our food autonomy, I guess, and, and perhaps even think about export markets. Well, I guess, and that's where it all comes back to me, is, is we've got all those things you describe in abundance. What we also have in abundance is cold weather. Uh, you know, so, yes. you know. Uh, well, you that's, know, you that's c- the point. I mean, if you want to get, if you want people to buy more local more often, you got to, you got to offer Maybe them. Under. Local foods all year round. So we can right. get hardwired. We can all become more hardwired to buy and look for local foods. Canes mm-hmm. want local. They're willing to pay for local. But we're not hardwired to look for local products because we know that Mother comes Nature and goes. Has, yeah. has limitations. Yeah, in Canada, for sure. Yeah, it comes and goes. It's a wonderful time in, this, in, the, in the spring uh, and the summer. But then, you know. Over the winter, not so good. All right, last thing, a former, I don't know if you know the professor, but someone from University of Saskatchewan, where I believe you were uh, did some work, uh, is yeah. talking about plant-based as an interesting solution to pandemics. And you know, when you put it together, <laughs> um, it's an interesting, I think it was in the National Post, interesting article that, you know, if you track every pandemic, many of them were sourced one way, shape or another, jumping from food or from animals to food. So they kind of reaching the conclusion, well, if we were more plant-based, we'd have less pandemics. Do you think this this holds water? Do you think this uh, it's a notional uh, good idea, I guess? Well, it caught my attention uh, just because, as you know, Michael, a lot of people go on our website and they use our data. I mean, that's why we created the lab in the first place. And so we have dozens and dozens of, of, of reports and people will want to look for uh, uh, data related to trends. And so uh, this particular faculty, who I don't know personally, mm. uh, wrote a piece for The Conversation, which is a, an academic outlet. Um, and he argued that perhaps if we adopt a plant-based diet, all of us or many of us, it could prevent the next pandemic. I don't know. Like honestly, uh, it it uh, of course he uses in his argument he uses uh, our data related to veganism, and and because uh, we actually did look at the number of Canadians actually who are becoming flexitarians and they're reducing the amount of meat they consume and and frankly the numbers are pretty impressive. It's over ten million now. We believe in Canada, and, and that number is continually, continuously growing, which is great. Yeah. I mean, it's more than a third of the adult population, right? Ten million ad, adult population is like 18, 19 million, right? Exactly. So, on the one side, but as we as, as we discuss uh, during our last episode, people are still committed to beef. <laughs> They're still committed to meat. So that's one thing that may not change very quickly. The the other thing is this whole 
argument around uh, diseases uh, and the and the and 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 the rationale behind COVID itself, uh, we don't, we still, science is still not clear as to how this whole thing happened. I mean, yeah. there's this notion about a bat in Yuan province, but there's still no conclusive evidence which suggests that someone actually decided to to make a bat a, a, is his or her lunch. Uh, there's or, still no, it's not clear what actually happened there. So yeah. Or did it we, walk we, out? Did or did it walk out the bottom of somebody's shoe from a research facility or something? Exactly. Just... Eating animal proteins has been part of our culture for for thousands and thousands of years, and we've 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 gone through pandemics before, and uh, we're going to see other ones. Is it related to our relationship with animal proteins? I, I'm not I'm not convinced, uh, to be honest. I, I think pandemics. I hate to say this. But I, pandemics are inevitable. Uh, even though Bill yep. Gates in 2015 said we need to plan for the next pandemic, I don't think we can avoid it. We can plan for it and make sure that the impact of the pandemic is is uh, is mitigated with mm. with the science. Uh, but they still going to happen. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, on that cheery note, let's wrap up the episode. <laughs> Thanks, Doctor Doom. Uh, let's. <laughs> Let's, let's wrap Downer. up the, yeah. Downer. Uh, well, let's wrap up the episode. Uh, we got some great guests coming up on future episodes. We've been booking, yeah, working hard. Uh, Michael Graydon. We've got Deanne Breesbaugh. We've got Serge from uh, Metro. So we've got great guests coming up uh, in addition to who we, uh, who we had today. And uh, first of all, let's thank uh, the folks at Omnovos for being our, uh, thank the folks at Omnovos for being our presenting sponsor. And if you liked what you heard, you can follow us on Apple, iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. Or, of course, on our YouTube channel, The Food Professor. Look for The Food Professor podcast on YouTube. Uh, please rate and review and be sure to recommend to a friend or colleague in the grocery or restaurant or retail industry. I'm Michael Lamont, producer of The Voice of Retail podcast and a bunch of other stuff. And I'm Sylvain Chalabois. Have a safe week, everyone. Sylvain, talk to you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>